Okay, welcome again. Uh, so this is, will be our first uh, technical session. Uh, we have a kind of exciting program uh, later as well. Uh, but the first papers, uh, we're going to have uh, three papers, two full papers and one uh, short paper presentation. Uh, so let us start uh, with the first one. Uh, the first paper is uh, ENDN, uh, an, if a, an enhanced NDN architecture with a, a P4 programming, a programmable uh, data plane. Uh, it will be presented by Oasim Karak. Uh, who is a PhD student uh, at the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering, University of Ottawa. Uh, he received his master's degree in telecommunication engineering from Institut National de Scientist uh, Appliqués uh, in Lyon, France. Uh, he also worked as a technical consultant and leading financial uh, software editor in France from 14 to 17. And his research interests include the future internet architecture, information-centric networks, software detailed networks, and the cloud. Uh, just as a reminder, the format that we're going to have, uh, we're going to play the video. Uh, there is a corresponding Slack channel for each individual papers, uh, for each individual paper. So please, uh, kind of, when you uh, have a question, type the question there. Uh, authors will be monitoring uh, that channel as well. And at the end of the video, uh, authors will be will have a few minutes to answer those questions that were asked in Slack channel. Uh, so with that, uh, I would like you to host, to ask host to play uh, the video. Hello, my name is Wasim from the University of Ottawa, and today I'm going to present our work, ENDN, an enhanced NDN architecture with a P4 programmable data plane. I will start by going over the motivation underlying our work. Then I will present our proposed architecture and the different modules inside it. After that, I will show some experiments we did as a proof of concept. Finally, I will conclude and present some future work directions. First, let's start with the motivation. In the current internet, let's look at the example of a user who wants to access a video hosted in YouTube. When the user queries the video, it is forwarded to the YouTube application server whose main objective is the content generation and hosting. However, the current network usually only offers best effort forwarding. So the YouTube server also needs to handle several content delivery tasks like congestion control, firewall, bitrate adjustment, and geofencing. Hence, most of the intelligence is in the application. The main question that our work tries to answer is, can we put these content delivery tasks inside the network instead of having them done by the application? More precisely, can we have more intelligence in the network? And so we want to examine the idea of an application-centric network. Current networks like the internet usually only offer a single delivery service to the applications. As a result, providers have to configure the applications to adapt to the network. On the other hand, an application-centric network would be able to adapt to the specific requirements of the applications by allowing the specification of custom forwarding services. The providers would then configure the network to adapt to the application needs. The advantages of this approach are as follows. The optimization of available network resources to better serve the hosted application needs. A better network manageability by allowing every application for writing logic to be configured in isolation in the network. And a faster resolution of network issues that can be detected and mitigated directly in the network where they happen. These advantages are especially prominent in the context of content provider networks like Netflix and Google where the providers manage both the network and the applications hosted on it. Here are some existing solutions that can help us achieve an application-centric network. The first important solution is NTN. In NTN, the network is aware of the content shared by the applications. 
And so it can optimize the delivery of the contents to the request source using, for example, caching. The second solution is network programmability. It allows providers to completely specify their custom forwarding behaviors directly in the network. One of the most prominent solutions that allows network programmability is SDN, which does programmability completely in the control plane. Another solution is P4, which is a programming language that allows the data plane to be programmed. However, these existing solutions face several challenges. For example, NDN is very well suited for applications that rely on pool traffic, but it faces challenges with other content delivery patterns, like for example the publish subscribe or push patterns. On the other hand, current P4 data planes allow for a single large P4 program to run in the switch. This means that if providers need to add support for a new application forwarding logic, they need to update this large P4 program and then insert it in the switch, which would need to be reset. Hence, downtime is always needed for updates. Additionally, P4 was designed in the context of IP, where the protocols have fixed size header fields. As a result, P4 has limitations when processing string-based protocols like NDN, which revolves around the variable length content name string. Consequently, while NDN and P4 allow us to move towards better support of application needs in the network layer, an application-centric network architecture is still missing. The main objective of our work is to design a novel network architecture that could be used to build an application-centric network. Our proposed architecture is an enhanced NDN architecture called ENDN that offers the following key features. An extensible catalog of network services that the applications can choose from. Support for new content delivery patterns like the publish subscribe or the push patterns. Allow the programming of custom forwarding functions directly in the network layer. Finally, provide the means to configure these functions in the switches without incurring any downtime. The first feature is implemented at the level of the control plane, while the three others are offered by the data plane. Let's look at an overview of ENDN. In ENDN, the control plane offers an extensible catalog of network services to the applications. Examples of these services are content delivery patterns like the publish subscribe pattern, or custom forwarding behaviors like congestion control, adaptive forwarding, or monitoring. The applications then specify their network flows to the control plane. A flow is specified by an NDN namespace along with the selected list of services that need to be applied to it. The control plane uses the different application requirements to generate the configuration of the data plane and then manage it. The technologies that we use in our data plane are NDN with some enhancements and P4. The control and data planes form together the ANDN architecture. However, the main focus of our paper is in the design of the programmable data plane. Hence, the network services are currently implemented as data plane configuration templates that are combined together. I will present you now the details of our proposed architecture. The data plane of ENDN has two main modules, e-processing and forwarding logic. The e-processing module contains the NDN forwarding pipeline with some modifications to support new content delivery patterns. Another modification we did to the NDN forwarding pipeline is to put the content store outside of the fast path. It is accessible through an internal phase to allow for easier control of caching decisions using next hops. 
The forwarding logic module contains several P4 functions that implement complex stateful forwarding behaviors per namespace, like for example, T-limit ring, show fencing, and stateful firewall. Hence, another goal of the e-processing module is to associate namespaces to P4 functions, as well as prepare packets for P4. Let's see how the e-processing module works in more details. The e-processing module follows the normal NDN forwarding pipeline with the following modifications to the PIT and FIP tables. The first modification we do is to promote the PIT as a routing table for data packets. This means that PIT entries no longer necessarily represent a previously forwarded interest that can be created proactively by the control plane. As the control plane can now create PIT entries, we want some of these entries to be persistent. This means that they won't be deleted after a data packet is forwarded through them. Like in NDN, PIT entries have an optional timer that is used as a form of garbage collection. Finally, both the PIT and FIP entries have an additional field that contains the name of the P4 function to execute. With these modifications, we call these forwarding tables EPIT and EFIP. The modifications are just described allow ENDN to support additional content delivery patterns. Publish subscribe can be done by configuring the EFIP route to create persistent EPIT entries when interests are forwarded. Push can be done by inserting non-expiring persistent EPIT routes. Let's now look at an overview of the e-processing module as a whole. When an NDN packet is received, it is first parsed to extract the values of the different header fields, the most important one being the content name. The parsing is done here and not in P4, because it involves a lot of string processing that P4 cannot do efficiently. The content name is then used in the forwarding pipeline to query the AFIB and EPIT tables and retrieve the extracted routes containing the possible next hops to use. These extracted routes, alongside the P4 function name to execute, are part of the e-packet that also contains the parsed and the end packets. This e-packet is then passed to the forwarding logic module for processing by a P4 function. Let's now see how the forwarding logic module processes e-packets. When the e-packet is received by the forwarding logic module, the P4 function target executing the requested function is retrieved. Every P4 function target runs isolated P4 code corresponding to a specific complex stateful forwarding behavior. Hence, every P4 function can be configured and modified at runtime without impacting the rest of the switch operation. The execution of the P4 function results in two outputs, a list of output actions and an optionally modified e packet. Here are some examples of output actions. The first action is to choose the next hops to which the packet will be forwarded among the list of possible next hops from the EFIP. Other actions are to drop the packets, notify the controller, modify some header fields, or execute some metering functionalities. Finally, if the E packet was modified, it will go through the departure to modify the corresponding NDN packet accordingly. Let's now zoom inside the P4 function target. The P4 function target is a lightweight P4 code execution environment. It communicates with the rest of the forwarding pipeline using a standard metadata structure that is directly accessible from the P4 code. The standard metadata structure contains two sections. The input section contains simple fields filled by the forwarding logic module, like for example, the incoming phase of the packet. The output section contains several fields that tell the forwarding logic module which output action needs to be done, like for example, drop the packet. The 
default function target also implements external functions, which are functions accessible by the P4 code, but not coded in P4. Thus, external functions allow us to perform string processing efficiently. This is especially important to allow P4 to access and modify the data on the e-packet. For example, an external function can hash a specified component of the content name and provide the hash integral value. This integral value can then be used in the P4 code to do a custom action based on the value of the hashed component. The P4 function target also manages stateful objects like registers and meters. Finally, as you can see here, the P4 code supported by the target contains only a match action pipeline. It contains no parser or deparser that are done outside of P4 because they rely on a lot of string processing. To better show the functionalities of ENDN, we implemented a proof of concept of ENDN and ran some experiments with it. Our proof of concept helped us validate the software feasibility of implementing ENDN. Our implementation is based on NFD that was modified to use some libraries from the P4 software switch PMV2 to implement the P4 function targets. Our experiments were then simulated using NDN sim. We also examined the hardware feasibility of an ENDN implementation and found that FPGA-based P4 hardware, like the NetFPGA SUM card, can be used where all the parts of the pipeline involving heavy string processing, like for example the e-processing module or external functions, are done in HDL. The first experiment we ran is the scenario of a geofencing application. We have the following topology that contains two main consumer regions, consumers 1 and consumers 2. The consumers of every region can only access content specific to their region. This region-specific content is also cached in regional producers. In S1 and S2, we have a first P4 function that will tag the interest packets with their region of provenance. In SR1 and SR2, we have a P4 function that forwards the tagged interest to the regional producers until the traffic exceeds a predefined threshold. In this case, the excess traffic is offloaded to the central producers. The load of the central producers is balanced using a P4 function that acts as a round-robin load balancer. These are the results of the first experiments where we measured the average RTT of content retrieval per consumer region and for both NDN and ENDN. New consumers in every region start requesting data every 50 seconds, which increases their traffic progressively during the experiment. In NDN, geofencing is done at the level of the application, which means in the central producers. This incurs an additional delay. However, some consumers can still access content in their original producers if they query the correct namespace, which explains the reduction of delay as consumers aware of the regional producer starts requesting content. In that case, geofencing is managed by the available FIB routes. In ENDN, as explained in the previous slide, geofencing is managed by the network. The regional producers are thus always used until the traffic is too important, which explains the low delay. The traffic is then offloaded to the central producers, which increases progressively the delay as the traffic increases. As a result, we can see that having more forwarding tasks managed directly by the network resulted in a reduction of delay in ENDN. The second experiment we ran is an application-aware congestion avoidance scenario. In this experiment, we have a topology that has two consumers and two producers running several applications with a link that can be congested in the middle. 
In switch 2, we put a P4 function that can detect congestions on the link, and in this case, it will send a new packet directly to the application running on producer 1 to notify it to decrease its bitrate. Here are the results we obtain when we measure the received throughput of every application. There are several applications running in the network. The sensor application has two namespaces, slash sensor that corresponds to a publish subscribe flow, and slash sensor slash alert that corresponds to a push flow. The VOD application is a normal pool application with two flows, one corresponding to the video search, while slash VOD corresponds to the video streaming flow. At t equal 100 seconds, a consumer starts streaming a video in the VOD application until t equal 150 seconds, which causes a congestion. The network detects this congestion swiftly and notifies the producer of the sensor application to decrease its bitrate, as can be seen by the reduced received throughput of the slash sensor traffic here. When the video streaming ends at t equal 150 seconds, the network detects that the link is no longer congested and notifies the producer of the sensor application to increase its bitrate to the normal level. The congestion has then been avoided autonomously by the network. To conclude, the main contributions of our work are as follows. We designed ENDN, a new network architecture that can be used as the basis of an application-centric network. ENDN can offer an extensible catalog of network services to applications to allow for the configuration of complex stateful forwarding behaviors directly in the network layer. These services rely on new delivery patterns that are supported through modifications of the PIT and FIP tables of NDN, as well as programmability in the data plane using isolated P4 functions. As a future work, several challenges in the control plane can be examined, especially in terms of the norbound interface, consistency and scalability. Finally, a study of the security implications of the new features introduced in NDN can be done to identify the potential vulnerabilities as well as the corresponding mitigation techniques. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Speaker uh, Asim. Uh, there are a few questions on the Slack channel. Uh, I guess you can see them directly or you can just uh, announce them. Uh, so the first question asked about the uh, EPIT. Uh, so, so the one that you showed on the slide uh, was kind of suggesting there is one entry for incoming interest for the, to return the data, uh, but that's not the exact model for the Indian. Maybe I misunderstood what you're showing. Is there a kind of, does it do aggregation? Uh, yes, uh, the the EPIT uh, works uh, very similarly to the normal NDN PIT for uh, the the normal like uh, pool flows. So if it's a, a flow that is uh, where you have like uh, one interest packet corresponds to one data packet, it's completely the same uh, model as NDN. So uh, it supports uh, aggregation. So that means that if you have, uh, you're querying the same um, uh, data packet, you get two interests that come uh, like uh, in a very relatively close period of time. Uh, the second interest will uh, add its uh, source face, which in our model we call uh, a data packet next hop to the, to the existing EPIT uh, record. So when the data packet will come, it will still be forwarded to the source. Okay. Uh, now the difference is in the case of uh, EPIT entries that are persistent. In that case, aggregation works too, uh, in the same manner. It just, uh, when you receive a new interest packet in the persistent EPIT route, you will still have this addition of uh, the new source face but the interest packet will also be forwarded through the uh, persistent EPIT route to refresh these routes uh, because they expire after a certain amount of time. Uh, so this uh, new interest will still be forwarded to the source just to refresh the routes. Okay, so there's a, a few more questions. So another question from Dave Oren. Uh, so he's asking what is... Uh, 
what switch has enough memory to have a decent sized bit <laughs> and the typical bit sizes according to Dave is a 16 to 200 gigabytes. Uh, yes, this is, I, I think it's a very interesting uh, question because uh, indeed uh, there is a scalability issue on the bit size, right? Uh, so that's why uh, one of the reasons we did the modification to the EPITs is to be able to have this kind of uh, persistent EPIT uh, routes that can be reused in order to reduce a bit this bit size. So uh, if you have like uh, an application that needs a kind of uh, stable delivery of data packets to a set of uh, subscribers, uh, only one route would be needed instead of uh, one uh, PIT record per uh, uh, individual uh, data packets. So uh, this is one of the of the reasons why we did these uh, modifications. But it's true that it's uh, like there are like uh, changes on this uh, on this uh, side about like uh, can we have something that uh, can really handle the the size of uh, bit entries that would be needed in a network. Or should we like think about like solutions to decrease this size to make it more uh, scalable? Okay, so another question from uh, Jun Xiaoxi. Uh, so he's asking uh, how to load P4 functions. Uh, are they loaded uh, by the administrator or anyone uh, can load them like an NFN style and uh, how to prevent the uh, malicious code execution? Uh, in our architecture, uh, the P4 functions are uh, actually generated by the controller. So it's the controller who has the, the full privileges to uh, do any modifications on the data plane configuration. And so it's only the controller who can uh, install new P4 functions. Now the controller gets these uh, requirements for the P4 functions from the applications. So. Uh, with the control plane that does this kind of, uh, I would say, uh, police work to decide if something uh, needs to be uh, installed or not. And the control plane is uh, at the end managed by the administrator, right? So, uh, but from a pure data plane perspective, it's only one entity, which is the controller in our case, who can uh, install the P4 functions. And are the signatures associated with like, the functions themselves? Like how this kind of channel is being secured? Uh, the P4 functions are not themselves signed, uh, but the, the API to uh, communicate with the switch, it's uh, like it's uh, in a certain uh, namespace, right? And so this namespace, uh, so let's say like you want to install a new uh, P4 function, you can either do it directly like you, you connect to the switch and you install it directly, or you send a specific data packet that contains in its payload like the P4 function. And this data packet is in a namespace that is uh, like uh, secured by the normal NDN mechanism, the signature to make sure that only the authorized uh, uh, like entity, which is the controller, can install it. Okay, great. Uh, there are a few more questions on the Slack, so please uh, try to uh, kind of communicate and answer them there. Uh, yeah. For the sake of time, uh, I will try to move to the second paper so we stay on track. And uh, the second paper is presented by Susmit Shanigrahi, oh. a name titled as What's in a Name? Uh, Naming Big Science Data in a Name Data Networking. And uh, Susmit Shanigrahi is an assistant professor at Tennessee Tech, uh, and his research interests are quite broad and the cover networking for big science, future internet architecture, and 5G mobile networks. Uh, so please, uh, I see host, uh, can you play the video? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Susmit Chanigrahi. I'm an assistant professor at Tennessee Tech. Joint work with our co-author, with my co-authors, Cheng Yu. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Susmit Chanigrahi. I'm an assistant professor at Tennessee Tech. 
joint work with our co-author, with my co-authors, Cheng Yu Fan and Craig Bartridge at Colorado State. So in today's network, naming at the application layer is separated from uh, the addressing at the network layer. So in this example, we have xkcd.com slash 1222, and the IP address for the host ends in 192.67. We can rename the content at the application layer. We can make it 1226.xkcd.com, and nothing needs to change. That's not the case for NDN. The same comic strip is in NDN is probably going to be named as XKCD slash 1226. And there will be a forwarding entry in the network slash XKCD that will uh, allow the network to forward the interest uh, interests to the data source. Now, if we change the name to 1226 slash XKCD, now the network state has to change. So let's say we have three comic strips, uh, 1226 XKCD, 1227, and 1228. Now we have to announce three routes into the network. So the motivation for this work is we know that names are the central construct for most engine operations. The way we name the data at the application layer, um, it affects both the application themselves but also the network, though, though in the context of scientific data. So why pick scientific applications specifically? Uh, first, we have been collaborating with different scientific domains, climate, high energy physics, genomics for a long time. So we have seen how they uh, name their data, how we can convert those names into NDN names for, for naming. Um, so the questions that we want to answer in this study is that how we can create uh, Indian names from existing names. Um, what are the trade-offs of such names? And if we have another scientific community uh, wants, which wants to use NDN tomorrow, can we come up with a list of recommendations for that community? so that they can, so this is the outline of this talk. So we talked about the motivation. I'm going to explain a little bit about how the existing names work in, in scientific communities and how we can translate them into NDN. Um, we're also going to talk about how naming affects different NDN operations, forwarding, routing, um, caching, things like that. And then finally, we are going to talk about uh, a different few naming recommendations for the applications as well as the network operators. With these scientific communities, a few things that we found is first, uh, these communities, they have uh, already, they have some sort of naming schemes. They are usually hierarchical. Um, they are community driven. So uh, the communities themselves came up with these names. Um, it's one thing to come up with naming schemes. Enforcement is completely separate things, uh, separate matter. Um, some communities uh, do it better than the others. The naming structure um, differs in different communities. So some communities, they use a sort of community agreed upon namespaces. Uh, for example, in genomics, you have the tree of life, so genus, species, species, subspecies, and so on. In some of the communities, uh, the namespaces are an artifact of data management. So someone came up with a scheme that makes most sense to manage their own data sets. The other thing I know we noted is that that the files they need to be identified as set of a as part of a larger collection. The names themselves, they are not only hierarchical, but they are also semantically meaningful. Uh, applications may not care about 
the specific um, information in the names, but the users and the scientists very much do. So though we can have a name, sort of alphanumeric string, all the scientific communities we have worked with, they have named their data in a way that allows them to identify, look at the name and be able to tell what kind of data it's, data is in that particular file, um, maybe where it was collected, how it was generated and so on. So let's look at a climate file. At the top, we have the original name. At the bottom, we have the translated Indian name. So at the top, we, the original name, of course, it has a host portion, which is uh, this portion, the directory structure, host name followed by some sort of high level directory structure. Then from here, we have the actual data organization. So we have CMF5, which is the organization or the project that's generating the data. We have output one. So this is an activity within that organization that's creating the data. Uh, Miroc, which is the institute, uh, followed by several other components that make sense for that particular community. And finally, we have the name of the actual file, which you might note repeats a lot of the previous components. Uh, so the resulting name looks like CMF5 output Miroc, Miroc 4H, and, and followed by different components. Um, in physics, uh, it's exactly the similar format, though there is a subtle difference we are going to talk about. So, so for uh, translating this name, it's pretty straightforward. We got rid of the host portion of the name and everything else was pretty much uh, the way it was before. So we didn't need to make any massive changes uh, to the naming scheme. So we changed that, we took that name, we worked with the scientists and figured out what information we need to embed into the Indian name. Um, it started with slash biology, SRA, and then different domain specific information uh, that made sense to that particular scientist, uh, or to that particular community. So the takeaway from this is that regardless of which scientific communities uh, we are talking about, there's a concept of hierarchy. Some communities have already named their data according to this hierarchy. Others, they have not, just like the SRA ID we saw, but they have some sort of community defined hierarchy, for example, the tree of life. And we can use that to, or, or the, the communities can use those to convert their existing names into those hierarchical names. Um, this is good news for NDN because regardless of which scientific communities we are talking about, we can probably find some sort of hierarchy uh, that can be used to name their data. And so fine, we can name data into for an Indian uh, network. But the questions remain that if you tell a scientist that yes, you can take your names and then use them in the Indian network. They're going to ask you, well, how much information should I include? Uh, what should be the order uh, for these informations? Um, how does the network handle these information? Um, what are the prefixes that we should announce into the network? We divided the namespace into two different types of names. One is expressive names, which has uh, more information uh, for, for that particular community into the names. So as a result, they are more, uh, they're longer. And then you have shorter names. Those are compact, doesn't have as much information. Um, 
Of course, expressive names carry more information um, that provides better context for both the application and the network. So in expressive versus order names, we have sort of a design continuum rather than uh, the exact lengths. So expressive names, they carry more information. Um, so they, they provide better context, both for the network and the applications. For example, if we have a probabilistic caching, we can cache any content that has CMF5 in the name. There's a trade-off here, whether we, exp we make the names longer and make the operations, uh, network op and application operations better, or do we create compact names that results in uh, lower overhead and smaller in network state. Okay, so I'm not going to go too much into the details of this because it'll take a long time. Um, but essentially, uh, for in network operations, expressive names are, are better uh, for both caching, forwarding, and routing. Uh, if we use the Popularity based caching, of course, there is no effect, but in any other type of caching, expressive names are better. Uh, for forwarding, it provides a fine grained forwarding plane. So if you have two sub components and you announce both of those into the network, the network can give you more granular forwarding based on the, the longer names. And that doesn't happen with the shorter names. The shorter names, on the other hand, they're potentially faster because it takes less time to parse them and process them. And also they, they create less state in the network. If we look at the, the data structures in NDN, once you have the expressive names, the interest and the data packets become, interest packets become larger and the data packet they have less space for the payloads. For FIB and RIB, uh, of course, expressive names make, mean they're going to be larger compared to, to, the, to the shorter names. So the example we have here is genus, species, subspecies. So if you have, if you're announcing three subspecies into the network, your FIB is going to be larger than just announcing a slash genus. But that gives you more, announcing more routes into the network gives you more control of how you can forward the packets. Let's look at publication. If we want to do a partial application, so genus, species one, subspecies being announced from one source, genus, species two, subspecies um, being announced from another source. Uh, we, we must have partial names because if we only announce slash genus, that does not support that partial namespace replication. So these cases, we can use forwarding hints um, to take, uh, take the request to that particular host that has uh, those sub namespaces. Um, um, for data discovery, more context is always better, uh, both for indexing, discovery, and search. The downside is uh, the privacy. Uh, we expose more information with longer names. What did we learn from, from here? The expressive names are better suited, both for network operations and applications. The trade-offs are smaller payload and larger in network state. Which ones should the communities prefer? It depends on the application and the network operators. Uh, our job in this work is only to point out the, the trade-offs. So we finish this off uh, by introducing the concept of minimal usable data units or MDUs. Um, so in scientific communities, a set of files are often used together. Uh, single files are pretty useless. So on the right, you will see a bunch of genomics files and they are always going to be used together. Uh, you cannot take, for example, the 
the file at the bottom and then hope to run some sort of, sort of computation. So in the context of scientific um, networks, it makes sense to treat all these files as a single entity. The interest and data packets should handle them consistently. So for example, uh, use, use the same upstream and downstream for, for this file, the same strategies. Uh, they should be cached and evicted together. And then subsequent request for these, since the data is large, uh, they should be sent past that cache. Note that we are not proposing uh, prefetching with this idea. Which all we are saying is that since all these data sets, all these files, they are always going to be used together, it makes sense for the network to be cognizant of that fact. Um, there should be sort of a hint at the network layer that, hey, uh, file 1.5 is coming in. That means all these other files are also probably be requested. Um, and it, it, they should be handled in a particular way. How this, this should be implemented? Uh, it's a research question. It can be implemented at a strategy. Um, what kind of handling makes sense? We don't know the answers to those. Uh, hopefully in a future work, we would be able to address that. Uh, going back to our initial goal, that if another scientific community wants to come in tomorrow and use NDN, uh, how should they name their data? So here are a few pointers. The names should be constructed using well-defined hierarchical, human readable and semantically meaningful components um, because those provide more context to the users, applications and the network operators. Longer names are more useful. Um, the trade-off is space. One option is to use linked object to have two names for the same object. You can have a both shorter and longer name. Things are named today. Uh, host name followed by directory structure followed by file name. It may be very tempting to replicate that name into an NDN namespace. Uh, that's not a very good idea. So if the location information is not needed, it's best to avoid including that information in the name. Um, the name should be identified, identifiable as part of the MDUs. For larger namespaces, the use of forwarding hints might save a lot of networks in network space. So the community should consider that. Any sensitive information um, should be put towards the end of the name and then encrypted so that the routing functionality and the forwarding functionality is not affected uh, by that encrypted portion of the name. Um, the recommendations for science network operators, the shorter names generally, uh, I know it depends on the implementation, but generally faster, but expressive names Help with the help with everything else, caching, forwarding, things like that. Um, again, data names should be location agnostic. So CMF5 CSU is much easier to handle in NDN than slash CSU slash CMF5. Unless you know, need to know the location. So if you have, uh, for example, two data sources that are load balancing between, you want to uniquely identify which uh, which endpoint your data is coming from. Otherwise, there's a chance that you might load balance in the network, but all the requests would end up at the same source. Um, the operators should also look into caching and forwarding the MDUs together for better efficiency. But as I said, we don't yet know how that can be accomplished or so this is a still an open research question. So just to conclude, um, the naming is the central construct for NDN. Efficient naming that can align name data with application requirements and, and the network. For science data, we define the concept of MDU. Um, 
it's a hint at the network layer that says, well, this set of files should be handled together. And we think it benefits both the applications and the network. And then finally, we provided a list of recommendations uh, for the communities, but how the individual communities handle their names, it's up to the name and the network operators that are carrying the traffic. Okay, so that's everything I had. Thank you very much for listening and I am happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, yeah, there's a few questions on Slack. A few are related. <laughs> uh, so I'll start with the first one. Um, or maybe some answers already. Uh, so I think you talked about the uh, hierarchical structure of, of the names, and it's not always uh, that the single hierarchical structure can capture what uh, people will be using uh, those data for, and uh, not necessarily like uh, they're going to be using the whole file, they may be just mm, cherry picking uh, some things. Uh, so one question is about uh, what do you think about uh, kind of either multi-structure or something different? Uh, and what uh, uh, Ken Calvert mentioned, uh, there was uh, other organizations so besides the tree structure, uh, like partition data sets in IBM OS. I mean, that's for the file specific. And in organizing, analyzing data from experiments, uh, he always found that they need to uh, totally order the dimensions in a and it's kind of a, quite a bit of pain. Uh, did you see the evidence or desire for uh, non-hierarchical organizing principles, like matrix structures? So I guess, I guess that will depend on the community, but most of the communities we have worked with, they have some sort of, I mean, you have to remember that these are not computer scientists, right? So they don't know the, uh, the history of naming in computer science. Uh, they uh, typically take whatever uh, the file, the directory structure is and name their data to, to match it. So if, if someone is using a particular application, uh, their names are probably following that uh, convention. Um, if someone is using, uh, their IT is giving them some sort of directory structure, they're using that. I have not seen too many um, sort of arbitrary naming scheme. So they have uh, climate and physics, they spend quite a lot of time and have elaborate documents specifying the exact semantics of the names. They have specified the components, which order they should go in, and they do it uh, for organizing their data sets uh, across uh, different institutes. Uh, so no, I haven't seen uh, that sort of advanced naming uh, things in these communities. I mean, I think those, uh, uh, at least the current standards are defined by, for very high granular stuff, like large files, uh, and kind of they expect people to download the whole thing before use. Right. And maybe it would be a different model later. Okay, let me ask a few more questions that are uh, on, on the list. Uh, so the question from uh, Karen, uh, have you considered anything like manifest to identify sets of files or named object that essentially comprise a larger whole? Or, or if so, how does this fit in, in your approach? Right, so we looked into um, looking looked into catalogs at the application layer. So it was built on top of NDN, and then we had a catalog that identified individual files. Um, but specifically for NDN, uh, if we have uh, names, it does not, and we request uh, names into the network, the same interest into the network, uh, it doesn't necessarily follow the same path. If you do have a different, uh, different topology, it might go, the, the first file may go on the, let's say two paths, first one can go on the left, the second one can go on the right, and then they essentially, uh, whatever the network decides in that case. So all we are doing in this work is saying that it might make sense for the network to handle all that content at the uh, uniformly. So if you cache something, maybe cache the whole thing at once, at one place, and don't maybe don't load balance between multiple parts if you have it. Um, I don't think it, that 
ability exist in an Indian network right now. Um, but as I said, it's, it's a research question. So we don't know. We have looked into it, but we don't know if the manifest would solve all the problems. Okay, let me take yet another question. We have one minute. Uh, I think a related issue from uh, John Roslavsky. A uh, related issue here is that many scientific communities are reinventing their naming models just as, think, uh, as things like this come along to study the current ones. Uh, lots of work in those communities about extended metadata, attribute-based naming, and retrieval uh, versus single distinguished name hierarchies. So I'm not sure whether it's a question, more like a comment. Uh, so I don't know, do you want to comment on the comment? Um. Yes, I think, let me, let me look at it quickly. So. I'm just worried a little bit about the time. So l let me just propose okay. this. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, you can take move it off. with this conversation to the Slack. It's already kind of a very interesting conversation there. And uh, we're gonna move to the last presentation of the session. Uh, okay, so the last presentation is uh, result provenance uh, in named uh, function networking. Uh, and it's presented by Claudio Markser, who is a PhD candidate in the Computer Networks Group at the University of Basel, Switzerland. Uh, his PhD advisor is Professor, Professor Christian Chudin. Uh, he received, uh, uh, okay, Claudio received his uh, master's in computer science from University of Basel. Uh, and the focus of his research is on, is on information centric and named function networking. Uh, so with that, uh, I would ask, to try to play the video. Uh, I hope it works uh, this time. Result provenance in named function networking. My name is Claudia Markser and this is work together with Christian Chutin, who is my PhD advisor at the University of Basel. Before I come to the contribution of this paper, I will first introduce named function networking. An NFN is a named data network where not only named data is available, but also named functions. Named functions are common NDN content objects which contain executable code. What applications in NFN do is they compose computation expressions from data names and function names. We see an example here where two documents are involved. The first one is data Alice, the second one is data Bob. And of interest is counting the number of words in both documents. And then finally, the maximum value of these two integers is returned as a final result. What NFN offers is an in-network expression reduction service, which is performed by certain NFN capable nodes. This includes two things. The first one, obviously the evaluation where function code is applied to data. And the second one is orchestration, which is about the decision where to evaluate which computation or subcomputation. We see an example on this slide. We have on the left side a client, then we have in the middle three NFN nodes and also the two documents and the two named functions are available in our network. The client on the left is interested in the result of the expression we saw in the previous slide. So what is done is encoding the expression into an NDN name, put it into a con put it into an interest and send it towards the network. In our example, it's NFN node one receiving this interest. And the first step of NFN one is to do the orchestration. In this case, NFN one decides to delegate the subcomputations, which is word count, and then later perform the application of the maximum function. So NFN1 takes the sub-expressions, encode them, put them into an interest packet and send them to the network. In this case, it's NFN node 2 and 3 who receive these interests. And again, they first do orchestration. In this case, they decide not to delegate the computation, but perform them locally. So they enter the computation phase and first request the data and the functions. Once these are available, they apply the function code to the data 
pack the produced result to a content object and send it back to NFN1. After receiving the two intermediate results, NFN1 receives the function code of the maximum function, applies the code to the intermediate results, and once the result is produced, pack it into a content object and return it back to the client. Next, we introduce a challenge in NFN, namely that of result correctness. We then present a solution approach which is based on provenance records. Before we come to a conclusion, we talk about ongoing and future work. Good news is that NFN offers a convenient computation service for applications. However, what also needs to be mentioned here is that the whole NFN network needs to be trusted that evaluation rules are follows, followed and the evaluation is based on the specified data. What I want to say with this is that the result correctness is in NFN is subject to extensive trust. The goal of this work is to relax these trust assumptions. Our approach is to lock the genesis of results in provenance records. The benefit for client is that they can trace the compute entities involved into the computation of a result and assess on this basis if a result should be trusted or not. Provenance in general is a directed acyclic graph capturing involved elements in a computation which can be data or processes or also software and hardware environments and also the relationship among these. In this work, we propose to integrate provenance records in named function networking. A provenance record captures for a single computation steps a. the identity of the compute entity, which is a public key, then b. signature and provenance records of all inputs, which is function and data, and c. an HMAC over the result, and D, an HMAC over the concatenation of A, B, C and the expression. Let me note that C constitutes a statement on the computation process which can't be plausibly denied by the computing entity in future. With this slide, I come back to the example from the NFN introduction. We see in blue hashes of the data and function objects and we see in red the identities of the NFN nodes. And now here in green the provenance dark of the entire evaluation. On the right side we see the provenance records for the word count sub-evaluations and on the left side the provenance record for the evaluation of the maximum function. What we see on the right side is that the input which is function and data is referred and on the left side we see that the other two provenance records and also the function is pointed to. Then on the very left of this slide we see that the final result also contains a pointer to the provenance record of the top-level call in the expression. On this slide, we will show how the provenance metadata can be used for result verification. The input of our procedure is the provenance records of all subcomputations and also a list of trusted compute entities. The verification goes in three steps. In the first step, it is checked if compute entities were involved which are not trusted. If this step fails, the final result should be seen as untrusted in general. Then in the second step, we check all the HMAC statements in all provenance records. And if this fails, it should be assumed that the respective provenance record is forged or tempered. Then in the third step we check the result HMAC of the final result and if this fails we can also assume that the final result was forged or tempered. 
In case all the three steps are successful, we can conclude from that that the final result is correct under the given trust assumption that it's authentic and of integrity. Before I come to a conclusion, I want to point to some topics of ongoing and future work. First of all, I want to talk about establishment of trust in compute entities. In our current implementation, clients hold a predefined list of trusted compute entities. It is, however, an ongoing project to develop a system in which clients exchange reputation information on compute entities. The information on the compute entity's reputation is collected by selectively re-evaluating -evalu expressions and compare the results with the ones delivered from the network. Helpful for the system is that provenance records are non-deniable proofs of the behavior of compute entities. We found that related work exists in the field of semantic web and also that the dweb community is facing similar issues. Then for future work, I want to point out to another approach where third parties, which are trusted by the clients, do certification of computing entities. As a second point, I want to focus on user constraint orchestration. In our current system, it is an issue that if the network delivers an untrusted result to a client, the client has no further options. That is why it is ongoing work that clients can proactively constrain NFN's orchestration process, which means to exclude untrusted compute entities in advance. Then as a next point, I want to mention availability of provenance records. In our current implementation, we have two variants. The first variant is to include provenance records in NDN's signature field. The second variant is that compute entities maintain tempering resistant append only logs for all their provenance records. It is of course an issue that compute entities have an incentive to not deliver disadvantaged logs. That is why we are thinking to integrate replication solution for clients or trusted third parties. Then the last point I want to mention is about faulty primary data. We should assume that results are, correct, are also faulty if they are derived from faulty data. For instance, if there is a broken sensor somewhere in a weather station and the sensor values are published in the network. Then, of course, also transformations, for example, from Fahrenheit to degree Celsius are considered as faulty as well. We think this is a topic of uh, NDN in general, that there should be conventions to flag faulty content even though it is authentic. And related to our work, we think that it's worth integrating this into the NFN result verification procedure. With that, I come to the conclusion of this work. We presented a solution in the context of uh, in-network services which act in a recursive read process republish mode. We're thinking of NFN but maybe also other systems could benefit from that. We identified a challenge which is about result correctness and in general about trust in NFN. Our approach was to relax the trust assumptions by introducing transparency and provenance and a procedure to verify results based on provenance. We mentioned several open topics for future work, which means that our solution still needs uh, more elements to be added in order to become a deployable solution. With this conclusion, I end my presentation and thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, 
I hope there was not too much noise from my side. <laughs> Uh, uh, so we have a few questions on uh, Slack. Uh, let me just try to reiterate them. Uh, so, so one question uh, I posted, uh, which was like a little bit a question for, for me, is uh, uh, how are you going to deal with, the, or how you think you would deal with the provenance records for the large data sets, like when the processing is over something very large, or even it's uh, something dynamic or something uh, is a stream of data? Um, with very large data sets, for example, if you are thinking of Flick, this would uh, be no problem with streams. I didn't explicitly think about streams, but this is not so easy to solve with what, how I presented it now. Maybe just to say spontaneously, we could maybe do provenance records for sections of streams but I mean, this was mostly like uh, how you even identify which specific stream you would be working on uh, but i i guess we can uh, take this offline uh, another question that i posted before everybody else is uh, about hmac that he was showing uh, in a paper and in presentation uh, because HMAC by itself isn't really authenticity uh, per se. Like everybody has to have this pre-shared key and basically everybody can uh, pretend that they have some record of somebody else. Uh, so I guess uh, my suggestion was uh, just not to deal with HMAC or do something uh, special about it. I don't know if you want to comment about this. So should I have road signature then you would be? I mean, uh, I don't know why you have picked the HMAC specifically. Like, or maybe there are some assumptions about the system in the first place. No, I would say I could also uh, just replace it with signature. Yeah, because that would be bring stuff. Uh, but let me just quickly jump to a different question from Jun Xiaoxi. Uh, so re-evaluation at random to detect uh, C misbehaving only works if the computation is deterministic. I don't know, Jinsha, do you want to expand uh, what is exactly the question you have? Or is it just a comment? Yeah, I I understand that I have to agree that's true, but this is also what we are always assuming in NFM, that computations are deterministic, that well, if you compute something twice, it's always the same result. It's actually just derivation of content from content and it's not inventing something new. Mm. So this is our assumption. I agree on what he says. And another question uh, that I put is about, uh, okay, so we can identify the bad uh, entity, or no, no, not entity, but rather bad uh, processing, but how can you identify a specific processor unit and uh, how do you even get around this uh, uh, processing unit? And especially if uh, cache is involved in this process, then uh, kind of how can you get around those things as well? I think you're uh, pointing to the future work palette that I had in the presentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, we have not yet implemented this, but the idea is that clients not only send um, expressions in future, but also their constraints to the network that the orchestration phase is constrained by this, which means under certain circumstances that there needs to be more round trips involved, that NFN nodes first do something like a campaign phase and check who would be able to perform a computation and then match this against the whitelist or blacklist that is provided by the client. Okay. And uh, uh, we have one minute for last question is, uh, have you thought about whether uh, your NFN nodes are vul vulnerable to denial of service attacks, uh, both on computation and storage resources? This is a question from Karen Solis. Yeah, I would say this is a problem, but I think it's not directly related to provenance records, if I understand. Or if maybe I didn't understand part of the question. Is it an NFN question in general? Okay, maybe I suggest that we move the rest of the questions and the clarification to the Slack because we kind of uh, end of the hour. Uh, I would like to all, uh, thank all speakers uh, for the great talks. Uh, we can just 
put a round of applause uh, in the chat. <laughs> and uh, so with that, uh, I will uh, ask, uh, kind of conclude the first technical session. Uh, we're going to have a 10 minute break, uh, coffee break, virtual coffee, actual coffee, uh, or some other parts of the breaks. Uh, and we'll reconvene in uh, 30 minutes uh, of this hour, uh, so in 10 minutes. <laughs>